Chapter 3 of The Eight Strokes of the Clock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter 3 The Case of Jean Louis. Monsieur, continued the young girl, addressing Serge Renin, it was while I was spending the Easter holidays at Nice with my father that I made the acquaintance of Jean Louis d'Imbleval. Renin interrupted her. Excuse me, mademoiselle. But just now you spoke of this young man as Jean-Louis Bourgeois. That's his name also, she said. Has he two names, then? I don't know. I don't know anything about it, she said, with some embarrassment. And that is why, by Hortense's advice, I came to ask for your help. This conversation was taking place in Renin's flat on the boulevard Hausmann, to which Hortense had brought her friend Geneviève Aimard, a slender, pretty little creature, with a face overshadowed by an expression of the greatest melancholy. Rénine will be successful. Take my word for it, Geneviève. You will, Rénine, won't you? Please tell me the rest of the story, mademoiselle, he said. Geneviève continued. I was already engaged at the time to a man whom I loathe and detest. My father is trying to force me to marry him, and is still trying to do so. Jean-Louis and I felt the keenest sympathy for each other, a sympathy that soon developed into a profound and passionate affection which, I can assure you, was equally sincere on both sides. On my return to Paris, Jean-Louis, who lives in the country with his mother and his aunt, took rooms in our part of the town, and as I am allowed to go out by myself, we used to see each other daily. I need not tell you that we were engaged to be married. I told my father so, and this is what he said. I don't particularly like the fellow, but whether it's he or another, what I want is that you should get married, so let him come and ask for your hand. If not, you must do as I say. In the middle of June, Jean-Louis went home to arrange matters with his mother and aunt. I received some passionate letters, and then just these few words. There are too many obstacles in the way of our happiness. I give up. I am mad with despair. I love you more than ever. Goodbye and forgive me. Since then I have received nothing, no reply to my letters and telegrams. Perhaps he has fallen in love with somebody else, asked Renin. Or there may be some old connection which he is unable to shake off. Geneviève shook her head. Monsieur, believe me, if our engagement had been broken off for an ordinary reason, I should not have allowed Hortense to trouble you. But it is something quite different, I am absolutely convinced. There's a mystery in Jean-Louis' life or rather an endless number of mysteries which hamper and pursue him. I never saw such distress in a human face, and from the first moment of our meeting I was conscious in him of a grief and melancholy which have always persisted, even at times when he was giving himself to our love with the greatest confidence. But your impression must have been confirmed by minor details, by things which happened to strike you as peculiar. I don't quite know what to say. These two names, for instance. Yes, there was certainly that. By what name did he introduce himself to you? Jean-Louis d'Imbleval. But Jean-Louis Vaudrois? That's what my father calls him. Why? Because that was how he was introduced to my father, at Nice, by a gentleman who knew him. Besides, he carries visiting cards which describe him under either name. Have you never questioned him on this point? Yes, I have, twice. The first time he said that his aunt's name was Vaurois and his mother's d'Imbleval. And the second time? He told me the contrary. He spoke of his mother as Vaurois and of his aunt as d'Imbleval. I pointed this out. He coloured up and I thought it better not to question him any further. Does he live far from Paris? Right down in Brittany, at the Manoir des Savants, five miles from Carèche. Renin rose and asked the girl seriously, are you quite certain that he loves you, mademoiselle? I am certain of it, and I know, too, that he represents all my life and all my happiness. He alone can save me. If he can't, then I shall be married in a week's time to a man whom I hate. I have promised my father, and the bans have been published. We shall leave for Carèche, Madame Daniel and I, this evening, said Rénine. That evening he and Hortense took the train for Brittany. They reached Carèche at ten o'clock in the morning, and after lunch, at half-past twelve o'clock, they stepped into a car borrowed from a leading resident of the district. 
<laughs> you're looking a little pale my dear said rnine with a laugh as they alighted by the gate of the garden at el Sevin. i'm very fond of genevieve she said she's the only friend i have and i'm feeling frightened he called her attention to the fact that the central gate was flanked by two wickets bearing the names of madame d'imbleval and madame vaurois respectively each of these wickets opened on a narrow path which ran among the shrubberies of box and ocuba to the left and right of the main avenue the avenue itself led to an old manor-house long low and picturesque but provided with two clumsily built ugly wings each in a different style of architecture and each forming the destination of one of the side paths madame d'imbleval evidently lived on the left and madame vaurois on the right hortense and rnine listened shrill hasty voices were disputing inside the house the sound came through one of the windows of the ground floor which was level with the garden and covered throughout its length with red creepers and white roses we can't go any farther said hortense it would be indiscreet all the more reason whispered rnine look here if we walk straight ahead we shan't be seen by the people who are quarrelling the sounds of conflict were by no means abating and when they reached the window next to the front door through the roses and creepers they could both see and hear two old ladies shrieking at the tops of their voices and shaking their fists at each other the women were standing in the foreground in a large dining-room where the table was not yet cleared and at the farther side of the table sat a young man doubtless jean louis himself smoking his pipe and reading a newspaper without appearing to trouble about the two old harridans one of these a thin tall woman was wearing a purple silk dress and her hair was dressed in a mass of curls much too yellow for the ravaged face around which they tumbled the other who was still thinner but quite short was bustling round the room in a cotton dressing-gown and displayed a red painted face blazing with anger a baggage that's what you are she yelped the wickedest woman in the world and a thief into the bargain i a thief screamed the other what about that business with the ducks at ten francs apiece don't you call that thieving hold your tongue you low creature who stole the fifty-franc note from my dressing-table lord that i should have to live with such a wretch the other started with fury at the outrage and addressing the young man cried jean are you going to sit there and let me be insulted by your hussy of a d'imbleval and the tall one retorted furiously hussy do you hear that louis look at her your vaurois she's got the airs of a superannuated barmaid make her stop can't you suddenly jean louis banged his fist upon the table making the plates and dishes jump and shouted be quiet both of you you old lunatics they turned upon him at once and loaded him with abuse coward hypocrite liar a pretty sort of son you are the son of a slut and not much better yourself the insults rained down upon him he stopped his ears with his fingers and writhed as he sat at table like a man who has lost all patience and has need to restrain himself lest he should fall upon his enemy rnine whispered now's the time to go in in among all those infuriated people protested hortense exactly we shall see them better with their masks off and with a determined step he walked to the door opened it and entered the room followed by hortense his advent gave rise to a feeling of stupefaction the two women stopped yelling but were still scarlet in the face and trembling with rage jean louis who was very pale stood up profiting by the general confusion rnine said briskly allow me to introduce myself i am prince rnine this is madame daniel we are friends of mademoiselle genevieve aimard and we have come in her name i have a letter from her addressed to you monsieur jean louis already disconcerted by the newcomer's arrival lost countenance entirely on hearing the name of genevieve without quite knowing what he was saying and with the intention of responding to rnine's courteous behaviour he tried in his turn to introduce the two ladies and let fall the astounding words my mother madame d'imbleval my mother madame vaurois for some time no one spoke rnine bowed hortense did not know with whom she should shake hands with madame d'imbleval the mother or with madame vaurois the mother 
But what happened was that Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois, both at the same time, attempted to snatch the letter which Rénine was holding out to Jean-Louis, while both at the same time mumbled, Mademoiselle and Mar, she has had the coolness, she has had the audacity. Then Jean-Louis, recovering his self-possession, laid hold of his mother d'Imbleval and pushed her out of the room by a door on the left, and next of his mother Vaurois, and pushed her out of the room by a door on the right. Then, returning to his two visitors, he opened the envelope and read in an undertone, "'I am to be married in a week, Jean-Louis. Come to my rescue, I beseech you. My friend Hortense and Prince Renin will help you to overcome the obstacles that baffle you. Trust them. I love you, Chenevier.'" He was a rather dull-looking young man, whose very swarthy, lean and bony face certainly bore the expression of melancholy and distress described by Genevieve. Indeed, the marks of suffering were visible in all his harassed features, as well as in his sad and anxious eyes. He repeated Genevieve's name over and over again, while looking about him with a distracted air. He seemed to be seeking a course of conduct. He seemed on the point of offering an explanation, but could find nothing to say. The sudden intervention had taken him at a disadvantage, like an unforeseen attack which he did not know how to meet. Renin felt that the adversary would capitulate at the first summons. The man had been fighting so desperately during the last few months, and had suffered so severely in the retirement and obstinate silence in which he had taken refuge, that he was not thinking of defending himself. Moreover, how could he do so, now that they had forced their way into the privacy of his odious existence? "'Take my word for it, monsieur,' declared Rénine, "'that it is in your best interests to confide in us. "'We are Geneviève Emma's friends. "'Do not hesitate to speak.' "'I can hardly hesitate,' he said, "'after what you have just heard. "'This is the life I lead, monsieur. "'I will tell you the whole secret "'so that you may tell it to Geneviève. "'She will then understand why I have not gone back to her "'and why I have not the right to do so.' "'He pushed a chair forward for Hortense.' The two men sat down, and without any need of further persuasion, rather as though he himself felt a certain relief in unburdening himself, he said, "'You must not be surprised, monsieur, if I tell my story with a certain flippancy, for as a matter of fact it is a frankly comical story, and cannot fail to make you laugh. Fate often amuses itself by playing these imbecile tricks, these monstrous farces which seem as though they must have been invented by the brain of a madman or a drunkard.' judge for yourself. Twenty-seven years ago, the Manoir del Sauvin, which at that time consisted only of the main building, was occupied by an old doctor, who, to increase his modest means, used to receive one or two paying guests. In this way, Madame d'Imbleval spent the summer here one year, and Madame Vaurois the following summer. Now these two ladies did not know each other. One of them was married to a Breton of a merchant vessel, and the other to a commercial traveller from the Vendée. It so happened that they lost their husbands at the same time, at a period when each of them was expecting a baby, and as they both lived in the country, at places some distance from any town, they wrote to the old doctor that they intended to come to his house for their confinement. He agreed. They arrived almost on the same day in the autumn. Two small bedrooms were prepared for them, behind the room in which we are sitting. The doctor had engaged a nurse, who slept in this very room. Everything was perfectly satisfactory. The ladies were putting the finishing touches to their baby clothes, and were getting on together splendidly. They were determined that their children should be boys, and had chosen the names of Jean and Louis, respectively. One evening, the doctor was called out to a case, and drove off in his gig with the manservant, saying that he would not be back till next day. In her master's absence, a little girl, who served as maid of all work, ran out to keep company with her sweetheart. These accidents, destiny turned to account with diabolical malignity. At about midnight, Madame d'Imbleval was seized with the first pains. The nurse, Mademoiselle Boussignol, has had some training as a midwife, and did not lose her head. But an hour later, Madame Vaurois' turn came, and the tragedy, or I might rather say the tragic comedy, was enacted amid the screams and moans of the two patients and the bewildered agitation of the nurse running from one to the other, 
bewailing her fate, opening the window to call out for the doctor, or falling on her knees to implore the aid of Providence, Madame Vaurois was the first to bring a son into the world. Mademoiselle Boussignol hurriedly carried him in here, washed and tended him, and laid him in the cradle prepared for him. But Madame d'Imblevalle was screaming with pain, and the nurse had to attend to her while the newborn child was yelling like a stuck pig, and the terrified mother, unable to stir from her bed, fainted. Add to this all the wretchedness of darkness and disorder, the only lamp without any oil, for the servant had neglected to fill it, the candles burning out, the moaning of the wind, the screeching of the owls, and you will understand that Mademoiselle Boussignol was scared out of her wits. However, at five o'clock in the morning, after many tragic incidents, she came in here with the Dame Laval baby, likewise a boy, washed and tended him, laid him in his cradle, and went off to help Madame Vaurois, who had come to herself, and was crying out, while Madame d'Imbleval had fainted in her turn. And when Mademoiselle Boussignol, having settled the two mothers, but half crazed with fatigue, her brain in a whirl, returned to the newborn children, she realized with horror that she had wrapped them in similar binders, thrust their feet into similar woolen socks, and laid them both, side by side, in the same cradle so that it was impossible to tell Louis d'Imbleval from Jean Vaurois. To make matters worse, when she lifted one of them out of the cradle, she found that his hands were cold as ice, and that he had ceased to breathe. He was dead. What was his name, and what the survivors? Three hours later, the doctor found the two women in a condition of frenzied delirium, while the nurse was dragging herself from one bed to the other, entreating the two mothers to forgive her. She held me out first to one, then to the other, to receive their caresses, for I was the surviving child, and they first kissed me and then pushed me away. For after all, who was I? The son of the widowed Madame d'Imbleval and the late merchant captain, or the son of the widowed Madame Vaurois and the late commercial traveller? There was not a clue by which they could tell. The doctor begged each of the two mothers to sacrifice their rights, at least from the legal point of view so that I might be called either Louis d'Imbleval or Jean Vaurois. They refused absolutely. Why Jean Vaurois if he's a d'Imbleval? protested the one. Why Louis d'Imbleval if he's a Vaurois? retorted the other. And I was registered under the name of Jean Louis, the son of an unknown father and mother. Prince Renin had listened in silence. But Hortense, as the story approached its conclusion, had given way to a hilarity which she could no longer restrain, and suddenly, in spite of all of her efforts, she burst into a fit of the wildest laughter. Oh, 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 oh forgive me, she said, her eyes filled with tears. Oh, oh, do forgive me, it's too much for my nerves. Don't apologize, madame said the young man gently, in a voice free from resentment. I warned you that my story was laughable. I, better than any one, know how absurd, how nonsensical it is. Yes, the whole thing is perfectly grotesque, but believe me when I tell you that it was no fun in reality. It seems a humorous situation, and it remains humorous by the force of circumstances, but it is also horrible. You can see that for yourself, can't you? The two mothers, neither of whom was certain of being a mother, but neither of whom was certain that she was not one, both clung to Jean-Louis. He might be a stranger. On the other hand, he might be their own flesh and blood. They loved him to excess and fought for him furiously. And above all, they both came to hate each other with a deadly hatred. Differing completely in character and education, and obliged to live together, because neither was willing to forego the advantage of her possible maternity, they lived the life of irreconcilable enemies who can never lay their weapons aside. I grew up in the midst of this hatred, and had it instilled into me by both of them. When my childish heart, hungering for affection, inclined me to one of them, the other would seek to inspire me with loathing and contempt for her. In this manor house, which they bought on the old doctor's death, and which they added the two wings, I was the involuntary torturer and their daily victim. Tormented as a child and as a young man, leading the most hideous of lives, 
I doubt if any one on earth ever suffered more than I did. You ought to have left them, exclaimed Hortense, who had stopped laughing. One can't leave one's mother, and one of those two women was my mother, and a woman can't abandon her son, and each of them was entitled to believe that I was her son. We were all three chained together like convicts, with chains of sorrow, compassion, doubt, and also of hope that the truth might one day become apparent. And here we still are, all three, insulting one another and blaming one another for our wasted lives. Oh, what a hell! And there was no escaping it. I tried often enough, but in vain. The broken bonds became tied again. Only this summer, under the stimulus of my love for Geneviève, I tried to free myself and did my utmost to persuade the two women whom I call mother. And then, and then, I was up against their complaints, their immediate hatred of the wife, of the stranger whom I was proposing to force upon them. I gave way. What sort of a life would Geneviève have had here, between Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois? I had no right to victimize her. Jean-Louis, who had been gradually becoming excited, uttered these last words in a firm voice, as though he would have wished his conduct to be ascribed to conscientious motives and a sense of duty. In reality, as Rénine and Hortense clearly saw, his was an unusually weak nature, incapable of reacting against a ridiculous position from which he had suffered ever since he was a child, and which he had come to look upon as final and irremediable. He endured it as a man bears a cross which he has no right to cast aside, and at the same time he was ashamed of it. He had never spoken of it to Geneviève from dread of ridicule, and afterwards, on returning to his prison, he had remained there out of habit and weakness. He sat down to a writing-table and quickly wrote a letter which he handed to Rénine. "'Would you be kind enough to give this note to Mademoiselle Aymard and beg her once more to forgive me?' Renin did not move, and when the other pressed the letter upon him, he took it and tore it up. "'What does this mean?' asked the young man. "'It means that I will not charge myself with any message.' "'Why?' "'Because you are coming with us.' "'I?' "'Yes, you will see Mademoiselle Aymard to-morrow and ask for her hand in marriage.' Jean-Louis looked at Renin with a rather disdainful air, as though he were thinking— here is a man who has not understood a word of what I have been explaining to him. But Hortense went up to Renin. Why do you say that? Because it will be as I say. But you must have your reasons. One only, but it will be enough, provided this gentleman is so kind as to help me in my inquiries. Inquiries? With what object? asked the young man. With the object of proving that your story is not quite accurate. Jean-Louis took umbrage at this. "'I must ask you to believe, monsieur, that I have not said a word which is not the exact truth.' "'I express myself badly,' said Rénine, with great kindliness. "'Certainly you have not said a word that does not agree with what you believe to be the exact truth. But the truth is not, cannot be, what you believe it to be.' The young man folded his arms. "'In any case, monsieur, it seems likely that I should know the truth better than you do. Why better? What happened on that tragic night can obviously be known to you only at second hand. You have no proofs. Neither have Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois. No proofs of what? exclaimed Jean-Louis, losing patience. No proofs of the confusion that took place. What? Why, it's an absolute certainty. The two children were laid in the same cradle, with no marks to distinguish one from the other, and the nurse was unable to tell. At least that's her version of it, interrupted Renin. What's that? Her version? But you're accusing the woman. I'm accusing her of nothing. Yes, you are. You're accusing her of lying. And why should she lie? She had no interest in doing so and her tears and despair are so much evidence of her good faith. For after all, the two mothers were there. They saw the woman weeping. They questioned her. And then I repeat, what interest had she? Jean-Louis was greatly excited. 
Close beside him, Madame d'Imblaval and Madame Vaurois, who had no doubt been listening behind the doors, and who had stealthily entered the room, stood stammering in amazement. "'No, no, it's impossible. We've questioned her over and over again. Why should she tell a lie?' "'Speak, monsieur, speak,' Jean-Louis enjoined. "'Explain yourself. Give your reasons for trying to cast doubt upon an absolute truth.' "'Because that truth is inadmissible,' declared Rénine, raising his voice and growing excited in turn to the point of punctuating his remarks by thumping the table. "'No, things don't happen like that. No, fate does not display those refinements of cruelty, and chance is not added to chance with such reckless extravagance. It was already an unprecedented chance that, on the very night on which the doctor, his manservant, and his maid were out of the house, the two ladies should be seized with labor pains at the same hour, and should bring two sons into the world at the same time. Don't let us add a still more exceptional event. Enough of the uncanny. Enough of lamps that go out and candles that refuse to burn. No, and again no. It is not admissible that a midwife should become confused in the essential details of her trade. However bewildered she may be by the unforeseen nature of the circumstances, a remnant of instinct is still on the alert, so that there is a place prepared for each child, and each is kept distinct from the other. The first child is here, the second is there. Even if they are lying side by side, one is on the left and the other on the right. Even if they are wrapped in the same kind of binders, some little detail differs, a trifle which is recorded by the memory, and which is inevitably recalled to the mind without any need of reflection. Confusion? I refuse to believe in it. Impossible to tell one from the other? It isn't true. In the world of fiction, yes. One can imagine all sorts of fantastic accidents, and heap contradiction on contradiction. But in the world of reality, at the very heart of reality, there is always a fixed point a solid nucleus about which the facts group themselves in accordance with a logical order. I therefore declare most positively that Nurse Boussignol could not have mixed up the two children. All this he said decisively, as though he had been present during the night in question, and so great was his power of persuasion that from the very first he shook the certainty of those who for more than a quarter of a century had never doubted. The two women and their son pressed round him and questioned him with breathless anxiety. "'Then you think that she may know? That she may be able to tell us?' He corrected himself. "'I don't say yes, and I don't say no. All I say is that there was something in her behaviour during those hours that does not tally with her statements and with reality. All the vast and intolerable mystery that is weighed down upon you three arises not from a momentary lack of attention, but from something of which we do not know, but of which she does. That is what I maintain, and that is what happened. Jean-Louis said in a husky voice, She is alive. She lives at Carèche. We can send for her. Hortense at once proposed, would you like me to go for her? I will take the motor and bring her back with me. Where does she live? In the middle of the town, at a little draper's shop. The chauffeur will show you. Mademoiselle Boussignol, everybody knows her. And whatever you do, added Rénine, don't warn her in any way. If she's uneasy, so much the better. But don't let her know what we want with her. Twenty minutes passed in absolute silence. Renin paced the room in which the fine old furniture, the handsome tapestries, the well-bound books and pretty knick-knacks denoted a love of art and a seeking after style in Jean-Louis. This room was really his. In the adjoining apartments on either side, through the open doors, Renin was able to note the bad taste of the two mothers. He went up to Jean-Louis and, in a low voice, asked, "'Are they well off?' "'Yes.' And you? They settled the manor house upon me, with all the land around it, which makes me quite independent. Have they any relations? Sisters, both of them. With whom they could go to live? Yes, and they have sometimes thought of doing so, but there can't be any question of that. 
Once more, I assure you. Meantime, the car had returned. The two women jumped up hurriedly, ready to speak. Leave it to me, said Rénin, and don't be surprised by anything that I say. It's not a matter of asking her questions, but of frightening her, of flurrying her. The sudden attack, he added between his teeth. The car drove round the lawn and drew up outside the windows. Hortense sprang out and helped an old woman to alight, dressed in a fluted linen cap, a black velvet bodice, and a heavy gathered skirt. The old woman entered in a great state of alarm. She had a pointed face like a weasel's, with a prominent mouth full of protruding teeth. "'What's the matter, Madame de Leval?' she asked, timidly stepping into the room from which the doctor had once driven her. "'Good day to you, Madame Vaurois.' The ladies did not reply. Renin came forward and said sternly, "'Mademoiselle Bousignol, I have been sent by the Paris police to throw light upon a tragedy which took place here twenty-seven years ago. I have just secured evidence that you have distorted the truth, and that as a result of your false declarations, the birth certificate of one of the children born in the course of that night is inaccurate.' Now, false declarations in matters of birth certificates are misdemeanors punishable by law. I shall therefore be obliged to take you to Paris to be interrogated, unless you are prepared here and now to confess everything that might repair the consequences of your offence. The old maid was shaking in every limb. Her teeth were chattering. She was evidently incapable of opposing the least resistance to Renin. "'Are you ready to confess everything?' he asked. <sighs> "'Yes,' she panted. "'Without delay, I have to catch a train. "'The business must be settled immediately. "'If you show the least hesitation, I take you with me. "'Have you made up your mind to speak?' Y "'Yes.' "'He pointed to Jean-Louis. "'Whose son is this gentleman? "'Madame de Laval's? "'No. "'Madame Vauroise, therefore?' No. A stupefied silence welcomed the two replies. Explain yourself, Renin commanded, looking at his watch. Then Madame Boussignol fell on her knees and said, in so low and dull a voice that they had to bend over her in order to catch the sense of what she was mumbling. Someone came in the evening, a gentleman with a newborn baby wrapped in blankets, which he wanted the doctor to look after. As the doctor wasn't there, he waited all night, and it was he who did it all. "'Did what?' asked Renin. "'What did he do? What happened?' "'Well, what happened was that it was not one child, but the two of them that died. Madame de Blaval's and Madame Vaurois, too, both in convulsions. Then the gentleman, seeing this, said, "'This shows me where my duty lies.' I must seize this opportunity of making sure that my own boy shall be happy and well cared for. Put him in the place of one of the dead children. He offered me a big sum of money, saying that this one payment would save him the expense of providing for his child every month, and I accepted. Only I did not know in whose place to put him, and whether to say that the boy was Louis d'Imbleval or Jean Vaurois. The gentleman thought a moment and said, Neither. Then he explained to me what I was to do and what I was to say after he had gone, and while I was dressing his boy in vest and binders, the same as one of the dead children, he wrapped the other in the blankets he had brought with him and went out into the night. Mademoiselle Boussignol bent her head and wept. After a moment, Renin said, "'Your deposition agrees with the result of my investigations.' "'Can I go?' "'Yes.' And is it over, as far as I'm concerned? They won't be talking about this all over the district. No. Oh, just one more question. Do you know the man's name? No, he didn't tell me his name. Have you ever seen him since? Never. Have you anything more to say? No. Are you prepared to sign the written text of your confession? Yes. Very well. I shall send for you in a week or two. Till then, not a word to anybody. He saw her to the door and closed it after her. When he returned, Jean-Louis was between the two old ladies, and all three were holding hands. The bond of hatred and wretchedness which had bound them had suddenly snapped. 
and this rupture, without requiring them to reflect upon the matter, filled them with a gentle tranquillity of which they were hardly conscious, but which made them serious and thoughtful. Let's rush things, said Renin to Hortense. This is the decisive moment of the battle. We must get Jean-Louis on board. Hortense seemed preoccupied. She whispered, Why did you let the woman go? Were you satisfied with her statement? I don't need to be satisfied. She told us what happened. What more do you want? Nothing. I don't know. We'll talk about it later, my dear. For the moment, I repeat, we must get Jean-Louis on board. And immediately. Otherwise... He turned to the young man. You agree with me, don't you, that, things being as they are, it is best for you and Madame Vaurois and Madame d'Imbleval to separate for a time. That will enable you all to see matters more clearly, and to decide in perfect freedom what is to be done. Come with us, monsieur. The most pressing thing is to save Geneviève Aimard, your fiancée. Jean-Louis stood perplexed and undecided. Lenin turned to the two women. That is your opinion, too, I am sure, ladies. They nodded. You see, monsieur, he said to Jean-Louis, we are all agreed. In great crises there is nothing like separation. A few days' respite. Quickly now, monsieur. And without giving him time to hesitate, he drove him towards his bedroom to pack up. Half an hour later, Jean-Louis left the manor house with his new friends. And he won't go back until he's married, said Renin to Hortense, as they were waiting at Carèche station, to which the car had taken them, while Jean-Louis was attending to his luggage. Everything's for the best. Are you satisfied? Yes, Geneviève will be glad, she replied absently. When they had taken their seats in the train, Rénine and she repaired to the dining car. Rénine, who had asked Hortense several questions, to which she had replied only in monosyllables, protested, What's the matter with you, my child? You look worried. I? Not at all. Yes, yes, I know you. Now, no secrets, no mysteries. She smiled. Well, since you insist on knowing if I am satisfied, I am bound to admit that of course I am, as regards my friend Geneviève, but that in another respect, from the point of view of the adventure, I have an uncomfortable sort of feeling. To speak frankly, I haven't staggered you this time. Not very much. I seem to you to have played a secondary part, for after all, what have I done? We arrived, we listened to Jean-Louis' tale of woe. I had a midwife fetched, and that was all. Exactly. I want to know if that was all, and I'm not quite sure. To tell you the truth, our other adventures left behind them an impression which was, how shall I put it, more definite, clearer. And this one strikes you as obscure? Obscure, yes, and incomplete. But in what way? I don't know. Perhaps it has something to do with that woman's confession. Yes, very likely that is it. It was all so unexpected and so short. <laughs> well, of course I cut it short, as you can readily imagine, said Renin, laughing. We didn't want too many explanations. What do you mean? Why, if she had given her explanations with too much detail, we should have ended by doubting what she was telling us. By doubting it? Well, hang it all. The story is a trifle far-fetched. That fellow arriving at night with a live baby in his pocket and going away with a dead one. The thing hardly holds water. But you see, my dear, I hadn't much time to coax the unfortunate woman in her part. Hortense stared at him in amazement. What on earth do you mean? Well, you know how dull-witted these country women are, and she and I had no time to spare, so we worked out a little scene in a hurry, and she really didn't act it so badly. It was all in the right key. Terror, tremolo, tears. Is it possible? murmured Hortense. Is it possible you had seen her beforehand? I had to, of course. But when? This morning when we arrived. While you were titivating yourself at the hotel at Carèche, I was running round to see what information I could pick up. As you may imagine, everybody in the district knows the Dame de Val-Vaurois story. 
I was at once directed to the former midwife, Mademoiselle Boussignol. With Mademoiselle Boussignol it did not take long. Three minutes to settle a new version of what had happened, and ten thousand francs to induce her to repeat that, more or less credible, version to the people at the manor-house. A quite incredible version! Not so bad as all that, my child, seeing that you believed it, and the others, too. And that was the essential thing. What I had to do was to demolish at one blow a truth which had been twenty-seven years in existence, and which was all the more firmly established because it was founded on actual facts. That was why I went for it with all my might, and attacked it by sheer force of eloquence. Impossible to identify the children? I deny it. Inevitable confusion? It's not true. You're all three, I say, the victims of something which I don't know, but which it is your duty to clear up. That's easily done, says Jean-Louis, whose conviction is at once shaken. Let's send for Mademoiselle Boussignol. Right, let's send for her. Whereupon Mademoiselle Boussignol arrives, and mumbles out the little speech which I have taught her. Sensation, general stupefaction, of which I take advantage to carry off our young man. Hortense shook her head. But they'll get over it, all three of them, on thinking. Never, never. They will have their doubts, perhaps, but they will never consent to feel certain. They will never agree to think. Use your imagination. Here are three people whom I have rescued from the hell in which they've been floundering for a quarter of a century. Do you think they're going back to it? Here are three people who, from weakness or a false sense of duty, had not the courage to escape. Do you think that they won't cling like grim death to the liberty which I'm giving them? Nonsense! Why, they would have swallowed a hoax twice as difficult to digest as that which Mademoiselle Boussignol dished up for them. After all, my version was no more absurd than the truth. On the contrary, and they swallowed it whole. Look at this. Before we left, I heard Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois speak of an immediate removal. They were already becoming quite affectionate at the thought of seeing the last of each other. But what about Jean-Louis? Jean-Louis? Why, he was fed up with his two mothers. By jingo, one can't do with two mothers in a lifetime. What a situation! And when one has the luck to be able to choose between having two mothers or none at all, why, bless me, one doesn't hesitate. And besides, Jean-Louis is in love with Geneviève. <laughs> he laughed. And he loves her well enough, I hope and trust, not to inflict two mothers-in-law upon her. Come, you may be easy in your mind. Your friend's happiness is assured, and that is all you asked for. All that matters is the object which we achieve, and not the more or less peculiar nature of the methods which we employ. And if some adventures are wound up and some mysteries elucidated by looking for and finding cigarette ends, or incendiary water bottles and blazing hat boxes as on our last expedition, others call for psychology and for purely psychological solutions. I have spoken, and I charge you to be silent. Silent? Yes, there's a man and woman sitting behind us who seem to be saying something uncommonly interesting. But they're talking in whispers. Just so. When people talk in whispers, it's always about something shady. He lit a cigarette and sat back in his chair. Hortense listened, but in vain. As for him, he was emitting little slow puffs of smoke. Fifteen minutes later, the train stopped and the man and woman got out. Pity, said Renin, that I don't know their names or where they're going, but I know where to find them. My dear, we have a new adventure before us. Hortense protested. Oh, no, please, not yet. Give me a little rest. And oughtn't we to think of Geneviève? He seemed greatly surprised. Why, all that's over and done with. Do you mean to say that you want to waste any more time over that old story? Well, I, for my part, confess that I've lost all interest in the man with the two mamas. And this was said in such a comical tone, and with such diverting sincerity, that Hortense was once more seized with a fit of giggling. Laughter alone was able to relax her exasperated nerves and to distract her from so many contradictory emotions. End of chapter 3